The uh, best, if not the best, memoir ever written by a Canadian. Ladies and gentlemen, Marina Neymat joins us. All right. Thank you. Nice to see you. That is not you. No, it's not me. Okay. That's not you. Uh, the, the, we talked about you were sentenced to death by firing squad, uh, the, and we thought of ways we could sort of explain that in, in, in your bio there, but the story is so interesting, we just thought uh, we'd let you uh, tell us. So you're, you're facing the firing squad, what happens? Well, when I was arrested, you know, they interrogated me, they lashed me, they lashed the soles of my feet, and then they just took us out. You know, we were blindfolded, we couldn't see where we were going. It was me and four other people, two young women and two young men. How old were you? I was 16 years okay. old. And uh, we just walked outside. I was thinking maybe they were taking us to another building. And then we walked and walked and walked, and then they told us to remove our blindfolds. And we all, we were shocked. We were outside. We weren't in a building or something. And it was in the middle of nowhere. And then we noticed these wooden poles sticking out of the ground. And that was when my heart just sank. And I thought, they are going to tie us there and they are going to kill us. But it still wasn't real. You know, you're 16 years old, you have lived a wonderful life, you know, you have grown up watching Little House on the Prairie. Mm -hmm. You know, and then this is happening. It just doesn't register. You know, they tied us up and that was when I thought, okay, I'm gonna die. And that was when a car just came up speeding and then it screeched, you know, stopped. And uh, one of my interrogators got out, got out of it and handed the, the other people, the firing squad, a sheet of paper. And they nodded and then he came toward me and untied me from the pole and threw me in his car. And I started kicking and screaming because I had no idea where he was taking me, what was going to happen to me. At least there, you know, I knew that, you know, this, this is pretty clear what's going to come. But in a place like Evin, you know, you don't know what's going to happen to you in five minutes. Evin is the prison, which is, it's a notorious prison. It is. It's where Zahra Kazemi was killed. Mm -hmm. It is. You don't, you, you, back then especially, you didn't need to have done much. You know, uh, one of my friends, she was 15 years old, the first one who was arrested from my school, Shahnush Bezadi. Two months later, we heard she had been executed. At the time, we didn't need to have done much. You know, there were just so many prisoners in the prison that the government was just trying to get rid of them. You know, it, they were trying to get rid of us. They were trying to make room for more. And you were, and you, you were arrested for, for just for not going along with what the Ayatollah had wanted, is, or for criticizing, for organizing? Well, you know, in school I was really outspoken. And um, after the revolution, a lot of our teachers were replaced by fanatic young women, 18, 19-year-old revolutionary guards who mm. were just talking propaganda and Quranic studies. And, you know, six, seven hours of sitting through that every day it really does get to you. Mm -hmm. And I just got tired. I raised my hand. I was 14 years old. I asked the calculus teacher to teach calculus instead of government propaganda. And she said, if you don't like what I teach, leave. I did. And most of my classmates followed. And this was the beginning of the school-wide strike. So you get thrown into the back of this car? Yes. And you get driven away? Yes. And what happens? He took me to a solitary cell. And there he told me, I, could, I couldn't walk. I couldn't even breathe. Um, he told me that uh, I had been condemned to death uh, by a court that I had never attended and that he had used his family connections to reduce my sentence to life in prison. And he said that he had done that because he had believed me when I said I didn't know, I didn't have the information they wanted me to give them. And then he said he's going to send me to the um, dorm of, of the women mm -hmm. in Evin, and that's exactly what happened. I was sent, and I was in a room with about 60 other girls. Were you forced to marry him, or is there something like that that happened? Eventually, yes, five months later. I didn't hear anything from him for about five months. He was at the war front fighting the Iraqis because Iran mm -hmm. was in war with Iraq at the time. And then he just showed up one day. I was called to the interrogation building. And um, he said, well, you know, you have a life sentence. You are nobody. You have no rights whatsoever, and I saved your life, and I want you to marry me. And if you don't, I will arrest your parents. So, you know, I, I was in absolute shock in the sense that, again, I had grown up, um, you know, I was a Christian. I had grown up thinking that you will marry somebody you love. You know, I thought, you know, somebody like Mr. Mr. Darcy will come along, and I would make, so, you know, I was I grew up thinking shock. you married somebody for a green card. I didn't know oh, that. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's a good one, too. Yeah. yeah. Right. But, but, you know, when I, I was growing up, you know, Iran was a pretty good place. 
So yeah. I didn't need to think that. You know, I just thought I would marry somebody whom I love. Well, what do you think now? You know, the, since the revolution, I mean, for a lot of people, when they think of Iran, we know the news of the day is uh, is Mahmoud Ahmadinejad saying what he said, which is it's like his greatest hits of what can I say that's against Israel today? Let's pull. Oh, there's right. that old favorite. Yes. And then you have the supreme leader coming out saying that nobody around the world is going to tell us what to do with nuclear power. That's we'll do right. what we want. That is what most of the world sees when it comes to Iran. Mm -hmm. How accurate is that a picture? Well, Iran is a very complex country. You know, Iran has wonderful people, very, very good people who are stuck into this situation they don't want to be in. But with what, what happened in Iraq, Iranians are really cornered. You know, mm -hmm. nowadays, if you criticize the Islamic government, like, for example, that's what I'm doing here, you know, I'm saying this is what they did to me, then you would be criticized by, by Iranians who are not really supporters of the government. But they would tell me that, oh, by doing this, are you asking for U.S. invasion of Iran? Do you want what happened to Iraq to happen to us? Mm -hmm. that is not what I'm asking for. I'm just telling the truth about what happened. You, when you, dis, you decide to put all this down a couple decades later, That's right. I can imagine the pro, like why now? Why, why, why go to this point? Why go back there in your mind? It's not that I sat down one day and said, okay, I'm going to sit down and write a book. It was a process that started the day I walked out of the prison. I went home to my family. We sat around the dinner table. They talked about the weather. You, so you they, never dealt with this? Never. So imagine people here, when they go through, through trauma, they receive therapy. I didn't get that. It was all up to me mm -hmm. to deal with it. And I pushed it just into a dark corner of my mind. And eventually, you know, I got so busy after I was released from prison. You know, I got my high school diploma by myself without being able to go back to school. Mm -hmm. And then we left Iran. It was a lot of trouble to do that. And then coming to Canada, it was just this brand new place, like a new planet, and you had to get used to all of that. So that took a lot of energy and mental and emotional. Well, your husband power. that you ended up marrying and your kids, how much of this story did they know before this book was written? Not much. They knew that I was in, I was in prison, but they had never asked me anything about it. They never wanted to know. Nobody wanted to know. Nobody still wants to know. You know, people, I'm criticized all the time. Why are you telling this? Well, if Anne Frank had not written her diary, mm -hmm. we would have been living in a different world. I wonder if it's part of the reason why your kids don't want to know is because the seeing their mother go through that is That's right. not something Imagine. You would... Yes. It is very difficult to read something like that about your mother. You, you can have all your memories. You can have all your life. Everybody, many people <laughs> don't go through what you went through, but we all have our thing, and you keep your secrets, and it's yours. When you commit it to paper, it is now of the pub for the public record. That's right. And you live in a neighborhood, you have neighbors, you have this, and now you walk into the mall, that's the girl who went that's through right. this. That's right. Were you prepared for that? I wouldn't have been prepared five years ago. Today, I'm 100% prepared because I realized that I was the perfect witness. Mm -hmm. I was there for a good reason. I survived this for a good reason. I lived to tell this story, even if people don't want to hear it. Mm -hmm. I will tell it today, and I will leave it to the generations, next generations, to really place judgment on me and on the system and on everything that happened. But I just simply couldn't let everybody be forgotten. You know, mm -hmm. in, even here, the Iranian community, when you're going to a, you know, to, to a dinner party, if you say I was in Evin, everybody just steps back. You know, they give you that look. Like you're, that like you're going to be a troublemaker. Say. Exactly. And people kind of have their head in the sand. You know, when something like this happens, the same thing happened in Argentina, in Chile. People didn't want to talk about it. How much did the death of your mother contribute to you writing this book? Oh, I think a lot. You know, if something happens when your mother dies, you know, my mother and I never got along. We were never close. And then she got really, really ill, and she suddenly died. And that was a turning point in my life. I realized my mother died without ever knowing who I am. And I thought, I want, I want my children to know who I am. I want my husband to know who I am. I want the world to know who I am. Come back again so we can carry this on, please. Marina Nemet, Prisoner of Tehran, is the book. Really nice to Thank see you. you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Good to have you on the Check out this book if you can. Prisoner of Tehran, a memoir. Lots more to come on the show, my friends. We'll be right back.